On the night of February 24, 2005, Cooey initially planned only to burglarize the Lunsford's home. However, upon seeing nine-year-old Jessica, he acted impulsively and abducted her. He entered the Lunsford residence around three in the morning through an unlocked door. After waking Jessica, he warned her, don't yell or nothing, and instructed her to follow him out of the house. This marked the beginning of Jessica's nightmare. Jessica Marie Lunsford was born on October 6, 1995, in Gastonia, North Carolina, and her arrival brought a wave of joy to her parents, Angela and Mark Lunsford. They were thrilled to welcome their only child into the world. Not just her parents, but also her paternal grandparents, Ruth and Archie Lunsford, were over the moon. In fact, they traveled all the way from Florida just to be there for her birth and give her a warm welcome. Jessica's early months were filled with harmony, growth, and happiness. At just five months old, she surprised everyone by starting to crawl, showing her eagerness to explore the world around her. Before she even turned one, she was already taking her first steps. Although Jessica's presence brought immense joy to Mark and Angela, their relationship unfortunately started to fall apart, and by the time Jessica was one, they decided to get a divorce. Angela moved to Ohio, and Mark took full custody of Jessica. Being a full-time dad and providing financially was tough for Mark, especially since his job as a truck driver required long hours on the road. Balancing work and taking care of Jessica became increasingly challenging. To help out, Ruth and Archie stepped in, allowing Mark and Jessica to move in with them in Homosassa, Florida. Living in a large mobile home, the Lunsfords created a supportive and loving environment. This move helped Mark to better manage parenting duties and care for his parents. Jessica was known for her charming personality, winning hearts with her calm demeanor and bright smile. By two years old, she was eager to be involved in household activities, much to Ruth's delight, who often captured these moments in photographs. Jessica's energy and curiosity continued to grow as she explored every corner of her home, often singing and performing on the back stairs, which she considered her personal stage. Her antics brought joy and laughter to Ruth and Archie radiating her innocent energy throughout the home. Jessica loved quiet moments too, often found snoozing on the couch with her beloved dog Corky, whom she adored. As she grew, she became very particular about her personal space, especially her room, insisting that no one enter without her permission. She even hung a pink sign on her door, warning visitors to knock first. Her bedroom was like a magical kingdom filled with her most cherished possessions, including her favorite stuffed animals, among which a tiger she often slept with stood out. Jessica had a notable dislike for the dark, keeping a nightlight and a flashlight close by during bedtime. At Homo Sasa Elementary School, she was known for her keenness, attentiveness, and empathy, standing out among her peers and teachers. When asked about her dreams, she would excitedly share her aspirations of becoming a singer, swimmer, cleaner, or fashion designer. She was also taking her first steps in makeup, with purple becoming a signature part of her style. It was at school that she met Tiffany, and they quickly became close friends, sharing dreams of becoming cheerleaders and practicing tirelessly for the school's talent shows. They also enjoyed long bike rides around the neighborhood, filled with laughter and adventures. However, what made Jessica happiest was spending time with her father. Their bond was filled with love and admiration, growing stronger with each moment they spent together. Mark would take her on motorcycle rides into karaoke bars, where she confidently showcased her singing talent. On one memorable trip to a county fair, Jessica fell in love with a purple plush dolphin. Mark won it for her in a game, elevating his status in her eyes to that of a superhero. That purple plush dolphin became one of her most treasured possessions. Meanwhile, her relationship with her mother wasn't as close, partly due to the physical distance between them and her mother's new marriage. From this marriage, Jessica had a younger brother whose name wasn't disclosed. 
At nine, Jessica was an active member of the local Baptist church, just two blocks from her home. She would sit in the central section of the back pews and was part of a group that promoted faith and youth involvement in the religious community. In her group at church, Jessica received math lessons from her tutor, Sharon, every Wednesday. They quickly formed a special bond, and Sharon began to lovingly take care of Jessica, ensuring she got to and from church safely each week. In early January 2005, a new family, unrelated to anyone in the neighborhood, decided it was a good place to live and moved into a mobile home just 150 meters from the Lunsfords. The newcomers were Dorothy and her son, Matthew. While details of Dorothy's birth are unclear, it's known she was originally from Orlando, Florida, and the eldest child of Betty Harris and a man whose identity remains private. Later, Betty married John William Cooey and had another son, John Cooey, born on September 19, 1958. However, when John was just one year old, his father kicked them out, leaving them homeless. This traumatic event deeply affected John's childhood. With no place to go, Betty moved with her children to her parents' home in rural Florida. There, as a single mother, she worked night shifts at a local truck stop where she met Bobby. Unfortunately, Bobby was far from the fatherly figure the children needed, mistreating John and Dorothy and subjecting them to harsh punishments without reason. John eventually left school and ran away from home, ending up on the streets, scavenging for food from trash cans and falling into drug abuse. At 18, John got involved in petty theft, leading to a six-month prison sentence, but he was released early for good behavior. Authorities hoped he could rehabilitate and turn his life around, but John fell back into old habits and committed more serious crimes. In 1978, he broke into a home and attempted to assault a girl, earning him a 10-year sentence, of which he served only two. By 1980, John was back on the streets on parole, drifting aimlessly until he met Karen, a woman with a daughter whose name has been kept confidential for her safety. In 1985, John and Karen married in a ceremony in Crystal River on Florida's west coast. Shortly after, they welcomed their first child. Fatherhood seemed to be the turning point John needed, providing a purpose that steered him towards a more stable life. He found work as a bricklayer, supporting his family with his earnings. However, the hopeful future soon unraveled due to their addictions. Both Karen and John found themselves entangled in legal issues, including bouncing checks, drunk driving, and disregarding court orders. Eventually, they separated. Karen moved to Fort Lauderdale in the southern part of the state, where she faced drug possession charges. John settled in Kissimmee, continued with sporadic jobs, and faced minor legal troubles. But as his addictions worsened, his crimes escalated. In 1991, he was arrested for indecent exposure to a minor and was classified as a sexual offender, sentenced to five years in prison. Yet he managed to get early release and was back on the streets within two years. Over the following years, John racked up arrests for a range of crimes, from theft and carrying a concealed weapon to public intoxication, drunk driving, public disorder, fraud, embezzlement, and burglary. Meanwhile, Dorothy married a man named Bill, and they soon welcomed their daughter, Mady. Bill passed away under unclear circumstances around 2004, prompting the widowed Dorothy to seek a new start with her new boyfriend, leading them to move in 2005 to the same neighborhood as the Lunsfords. Shortly after settling in their new home, Dorothy and her boyfriend, along with Mady, her husband, and their two-year-old son, all moved in together. That same year, John also moved to Homosassa, wanting to be near Dorothy, the only person he trusted. He initially found a job at a restaurant that allowed him to live alone, but he soon lost both the job and his place to live. His sister then offered him a place in her new home. However, John failed to report his change of residence to his parole officer, a mandatory requirement for registered sex offenders to ensure authorities and neighbors are aware of the potential risk to minors in the area. One day after wandering around, John came across the Lunsford's house and saw Jessica playing in the garden with her dog, estimating her to be about six years old. He spent a long time watching her. On Wednesday, February 23, 2005, Jessica went to school as usual and later went shopping with Ruth and Archie. Then Sharon picked her up to go to church together. At the same time, nearby at a junkyard, John, Matt, Macy's boyfriend, and Dorothy were spending the afternoon drinking and using drugs with friends.
Around nine in the evening, Sharon brought Jessica back home and they said a warm goodbye. At the same time, Mark returned from work and settled down to watch TV while Jessica played on the sofa nearby. He finished an episode of a show and then told his daughter he would be out for the night as he had a date. Before leaving, Jessica hugged him tightly and told him she loved him. Then she took a shower and her grandmother tucked her into bed and wished her good night before going to sleep herself. Around one in the morning, John, Matt, and Dorothy left their friends and returned home. While Dorothy and Matt went to bed, John stayed awake in his room, craving more alcohol and drugs but without money. He remembered the Lunsford's house and thought it could be his solution. Determined, he made his way there, carefully cut the screen door and entered the living room. Stealthily, he went to Jessica's room, covered her mouth to silence her, and told her to come outside with him. Clutching her purple plush dolphin, the frightened girl obeyed. John led her to Dorothy's mobile home, entered through a window, and then abused and held her captive. Around 5 a.m., Mark returned from his date just before his usual waking time for work. He noticed Jessica's alarm going off without her turning it off. He went to her room to wake her up, but found her bed empty. He quickly asked Ruth and Archie if Jessica was with them, but they hadn't seen her either. Alarmed, they started searching the house. Realizing something was wrong, Mark urged Ruth to call 911. Soon, local police arrived, and with the help of friends, family, and specialized canine units, they started searching for Jessica. Meanwhile, aware of the police presence, John told Jessica to hide in the closet because he was leaving for work. She followed his instructions and stayed quiet, unnoticed by anyone in the house. Despite the search expanding to include state and federal agencies, there were no clues to Jessica's whereabouts by the end of the day. No traces or foreign objects were found at her home. Jessica spent the night in the closet, consumed by fear. The next day, John left through the window, but left the TV on with some volume, hoping it would cover any noise from Jessica and make it seem like he was still there. Meanwhile, the police interviewed all the registered sex offenders in the area and noticed that John's listed address was no longer valid. They went to the address associated with Dorothy. They denied knowing John's whereabouts and claimed he didn't live there. With no search warrant, the officers could only conduct a cursory search. Feeling the pressure from the authorities, John panicked, knowing he needed to act fast to get rid of Jessica and avoid capture. He decided to dig a hole in the backyard, and shockingly, his actions went unnoticed. On February 27, 2005, three days after taking her, he lied to Jessica, telling her he would return her to her family. He tied her hands and convinced her to get into two garbage bags, claiming it would prevent her from being seen. Jessica complied, still holding onto her stuffed dolphin. Then he buried her alive in the hole and covered it with garden leaves. Later, John told Dorothy he had found a job in Savannah, Georgia, and asked her for money to travel there. With Maddie's help, using a fake name, he bought a bus ticket. Once in Savannah, he found shelter at a homeless center. However, he was soon detained for a drug-related offense, but due to Georgia authorities being unaware of his Florida crimes, he was released. Back in Florida, the search for Jessica continued with hundreds of volunteers combing the area around her home, but no trace of her was found. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. As time passed, the distress for Mark and his family grew, but they tried to maintain hope and fend off their worst fears. Meanwhile, John moved further away from the scene of his horrific crimes, relocating to Augusta, Georgia. There, he stayed in a facility provided by the Salvation Army. On March 13, 2005, the Lunsfords received disheartening news. On that day, the police informed Jessica's family that a nearby sex offender was sought for questioning in connection with her case. They were told that if he didn't present himself within 48 hours, his identity would be publicly disclosed. The possibility that a sexual predator might be involved shattered the remaining hopes of the Lunsford family, who braced themselves for the worst possible news. The next day, March 14th, 19 days after Jessica's disappearance, detectives returned to Dorothy's house with a search warrant. They found bloodstains on the mattress in John's room, which shifted his status in the investigation to a person of interest. However, they faced a lack of cooperation from Dorothy, Maddie, and Matt, who all claimed to have no knowledge of John's whereabouts. 
Determined to find the suspect, the authorities sought the media's help, and soon his image was broadcast across various channels. A shelter secretary, whose name wasn't disclosed, recognized him and immediately informed the authorities about his location at the homeless shelter. On March 17, 2005, Augusta police located John. They contacted the county sheriff's office and two detectives went to interrogate him. During the interrogation, John appeared visibly agitated and repeatedly denied knowing Jessica or having any information about her case. When the detectives suggested a polygraph test, John agreed but also asked for a lawyer. Despite this request, the detectives continued the interrogation. The next day, John underwent the polygraph test conducted by an FBI special agent. Under the pressure of these proceedings, John cracked and confessed to the crime, even providing the location of Jessica's body. Authorities in Homo Sassa were immediately notified and an investigation team arrived at Dorothy's home just after midnight on Saturday, March 19th. There, they discovered the burial site as John had described. After digging, the small body of Jessica was unearthed and removed from the garbage bags. In a heart-wrenching discovery, the team found she was still holding her cherished purple dolphin, a gift from her father and a symbol of their profound love. At dawn, Mark arrived at the scene. With a trembling voice, he could only say that Jessica was finally home. On March 20th, John was jailed and kept under strict surveillance to prevent any self-harm attempts. Concurrently, Dorothy, Maddie, and Matt were arrested and charged with obstructing justice for providing false information to the police. The forensic examiner performed the autopsy on Jessica's body and concluded she died from asphyxiation. His examination also revealed evidence of sexual assault that occurred shortly before her death, aligning with the findings of other investigators. DNA analysis of the mattress from John's room showed traces from both him and Jessica. Additionally, experts found Jessica's fingerprints inside the closet, amassing substantial evidence against John. On April 1, 2005, John was charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, sexual assault, and burglary. Charges against Dorothy, Maddie, and Matt were dropped. Five days later, John pleaded not guilty in court, and the state announced its intention to seek the death penalty leading to his continued detention without bail. Determined to prevent other children from facing a tragedy like his daughter's, Mark collaborated with two representatives to promote legislation known as Jessica Lunsford's Law. The law aimed to impose stricter penalties on sexual offenders and required electronic monitoring for those on parole. It also called for improved access to state database records to prevent predators from evading justice across state lines. The law was quickly passed and signed by the governor on May 2, 2005, becoming effective in September. On the night of March 5, 2006, while in custody, John overheard some officers discussing the threat individuals like him posed to minors. John, who had a high opinion of himself and didn't see himself as a sexual offender, felt insulted by the comments he overheard. He told the officers that he never intended to do what he did and didn't view himself as the monster they were describing. His words were later seen as an additional admission of guilt. In the spring of that year, Judge Richard Howard faced the challenge of assembling an impartial jury for John's trial. He aimed to select jurors who hadn't formed any prior opinions about the accused's guilt or innocence. Judge Howard eventually selected residents from Lake County, far from Homo Sassa, and arranged for them to stay in an undisclosed hotel during the trial. In June 2006, Judge Howard encountered another significant challenge, deciding whether John's confession to the detectives in Augusta should be dismissed or included in the trial. He determined that John's rights were violated because his request for a lawyer was ignored, rendering the confession unreliable. However, only the initial confession was dismissed. The court allowed all evidence gathered post-confession, including the discovery of Jessica's body, and John's subsequent incriminating statements to investigators and prison officers to be admitted. The jury selection process faced difficulties in maintaining impartiality and after failed attempts was canceled. To overcome this, the trial was moved to Miami-Dade County at the opposite end of the state. John's trial began on March 1, 2007. The state attorney opened his case by linking the accused to the crime through Jessica's DNA and fingerprints found in the closet. 
The defense attorney urged the jury to control their emotions and maintain skepticism towards the prosecution's claims. He also questioned the feasibility of John abducting Jessica without waking Ruth, Archie, and their dog, who were all in the house. Then the defense attorney brought forward experts who discussed John's history of drug and alcohol abuse and his emotional suffering during childhood, trying to argue that his culpability for the heinous acts he committed was diminished. However, on March 7, 2007, after four hours of deliberation, the jury found John Cowie guilty of first-degree murder, sexual assault of a minor, and kidnapping. The remaining task for the jury was to decide between life imprisonment without parole or the death penalty, the only options under Florida law. On August 11, 2007, after deliberating for just over an hour, the jury voted 10 to 2 in favor of the death penalty for John. At the sentencing hearing on August 24th, John was not only given the death penalty, but also three consecutive life sentences. On hearing the sentence, Mark and Jessica's grandparents embraced and wept. Outside the courthouse, Mark told reporters that he was confident the sentence would not change on appeal, given the gravity of the crime. John was then handcuffed and escorted from the crowded courtroom, immediately transferred to the Florida Department of Corrections. On a poignant note, Mark experienced the joy of fatherhood again on October 6, 2007, coinciding with Jessica's birthday when his new son was born. For Mark, this was a sign of life offering a second chance, deeply moving him. John was transferred to a hospital in Jacksonville, Florida on September 30, 2009, where he died of cancer. Jessica's grandmother, Ruth, when asked by the media about John's death, stated she felt no sorrow for him and would be dancing in the streets if she were physically able. Mark, upon learning of John's death, expressed relief that this tragic chapter, the most horrific of his life, had finally concluded. It was time to turn the page. And so, dear viewers, this concludes today's episode of The Crime Storyteller. Please remember to subscribe and like if you appreciate my work. Good night, and I'll see you in the next crime story.